So in this section, uh, I would like to review some linear algebra. And uh, this linear algebra is not totally specific to deep learning. I use this type of uh, review for all sorts of different courses in graphics, uh, vision, robotics, uh, machine learning. I would think that uh, these are the basics of linear algebra that uh, people should know about and should have learned about in an undergraduate course. So we start with vectors and a vector can specify a point or a direction in n-dimensional space and as notation we are using bold font for a vector and not bold font for a scalar. That's at least the, our goal. It's hard to keep that completely consistent throughout the complete course, but that is my standard notation. Um, a vector comes from a vector space where uh, Rn is uh, a set where the vectors live, plus is the vector addition, and then R is a field. If you want to know more about these structures, then uh, you would have to look that up online. We're not really uh, doing linear algebra in a formal sense. And um, for notation, we generally assume column vectors. So there are some examples uh, of how the notation works. And so you see that these vectors are given as columns, x, y, z. This is often when one describes uh, three-dimensional points in space, but for extensions to higher dimensions, it is better to denote the individual components of a vector x, that is a vector boldface x, as x1, x2, x3, up to xn. The length of a vector, or also the two-norm, as you can see here, this is uh, the vector, then you have these double bars, and the subscript 2 means it's the 2 norm, uh, is computed by summing up each entry of the vector, squaring it, and then taking the square root of the complete sum. We call a unit vector a vector whose length is 1. That means the two norm of the vector is one. A zero vector, we call the vector whose components are all zeros. For example, zero, zero, zero transpose. The vector addition is written by uh, a plus sign and again, uh, just a general warning in mathematics, the different symbols are often overloaded. So if you see this, then this refers to the vector addition and um, is an example for a three-dimensional space. If we add the vectors u plus v, and u is given by u1, u2, u3, and v is given by v1, v2, v3, then the sum is computed by computing the sum uh, dimension-wise. So first dimension u1 plus v1, and so on, u3 plus v3. The graphical interpretation that's easy in maybe 2D and 3D is that if a vector v and u are added, then you see the vector v here and the vector u here. Uh, the resulting vector u plus v is uh, derived by first drawing the vector v, maybe starting at the origin, and then starting to draw the vector u at the tip of vector v. And uh, then the resulting vector you get from the tip of v to the tip of u is the vector u plus v. Vector subtraction is analogous. It is also working dimension-wise. So you see, for example, the first dimension here is first element of u, 
minus first element of v and the graphical interpretation now you start at the origin and draw both vectors you draw u and you draw v starting from the same point and then u minus v goes from the tip of the second vector v to the tip of the first vector u so this vector up here that you see this is the vector u minus v multiplication with a scalar also works component wise so the scalar a is multiplied here with the vector boldface u also written as a times and this is of course is just an example in three dimension this always works in uh, arbitrary dimensions u1 u2 u3 and you see this multiplication component wise a is multi multiplied by each component and then the output again is a vector the graphical interpretation if you start out by drawing the vector u is that the vector either gets longer or is made shorter so for example 2 times u results in a vector that is twice as long as the original vector v the Hadamard product also called Schur product or entrywise product um, has the following notation it's like a dot with a circle around there are multiple different types of notation I just like this one so we have a vector w that is computed by entrywise or Hadamard uh, entrywise multiplication or Hadamard product u uh, Hadamard product v and it's computed by entrywise multiplication okay it's u1 times v1 gives you the first component and then for example u3 types times v3 gives you the last component the inner product also called dot product inner product scalar product measures how much two vectors are aligned probably does a bit more than that but uh, that's one thing you can do with it so the notation is these brackets and then you write u comma v in the middle or if you write it as matrix uh, multiplication it's u transpose v or you write it with this scalar product dot sign u dot v so all three ways are a notation that you will encounter so here is an example we want to compute the inner product between vector u and vector v and in this example in this example the vectors are three dimensional u1 u2 u3 multiplied with v1 v2 v3 note that this here now is a row vector this here is a column vector and then the result is u1 times v1 plus u times times u2 times v2 plus u3 times v3 again doing everything super slow here uh, what's the difference to the entry wise product or Hadamard product the difference is that here the output is a scalar a single value and going back what you see here the output was a vector um, now some simple sanity checks for the Hadamard product as well as the inner product this only works if the vectors have the same length that means not length in the sense of the L2 norm but if they have the same number of entries so let's better say they have the same dimension so like a vector with seven uh, components dimensions can be uh, you can compute a scalar product with another vector that has seven components seven dimensions let's look at the graphical interpretation um, there is 
a vector u and then there is a vector b and there is an angle theta between them. And as output, we obtain a scalar. So one graphical interpretation is that the angle theta between the two vectors u and v is related, is computed as follows, the cosine of theta equals to the scalar product, inner product between u and v divided by the length of u times the length of v. From this we can know that two vectors are perpendicular or orthogonal if and only if the inner product uv is zero, that means cosine theta equals zero or theta equals pi divided by half, measuring angles in radians. Um, now we can use this inner product scalar product uh, to also express the Euclidean norm. Um, so if we take the length of a vector squared, then this is the same as the inner product of a vector with itself. So this is actually another way to write this length square. We have the commutative law. So inner product uv is the same as inner product vu, where they kind of switch the order. And the distributive law uv plus w equals inner product uv um, plus inner product uw. So let's discuss vector norms in a bit more detail. A norm is a function that assigns a strictly positive length or size to each vector in a vector space except for the zero vector, which is assigned a length of zero. A norm must also satisfy certain properties pertaining to scalability and additiv additivity and a norm is generally denoted by these double bars and in the middle you write the vector that you want to compute the norm of and often as a subscript you denote what, what type of norm you're using. So now specifically a vector norm is a mapping from some vector in R n to the scalars R with the following three properties. Non-negativity, that means the norm of any vector has to be greater or equal to zero for all possible vectors. And the norm can only be zero if and only if uh, x, the vector itself, is the zero vector. That means, as discussed before, a vector where all its entries are zero. Scalability, taking some arbitrary scalar alpha and multiplying it with the vector and then taking the norm is the same as taking the vector norm first and then multiplying it with the absolute value of the scalar. So what that means is that if you multiply a vector by 2.7 and then compute the norm. This is the same as taking the norm of the individual vector before multiplication and then multiplying by 2.7. Um, this one, maybe I learned this as the triangle inequality. That means that the norm of the vector x plus y is smaller equal to the norm of x plus the norm of y. So what that means in terms of the triangle, it says that the uh, sum of the two uh, 
sides in a triangle have to be uh, larger equal to the uh, third side. So um, here are some example definitions of a norm on a vector x in Rn. So we have the one norm, also denoted by x subscript 1, is simply the sum over all the absolute values of the entries. The two norm is, as we discussed before, we sum over all entries square, and then we take the square root. The maximum norm is looking at all entries and picking the maximum absolute value. Generalizing these three cases, um, we can talk about the LP norm or P norm, where we take the absolute values of the vector, we raise them to the power of P, for example, in the 1 norm you would raise to the power of 1, in the 2 norm you would raise to the power of 2. You can also do no, not integer norms, you could have a 0 0.7 norm maybe. Um, and then after you build this sum, you take the uh, pth uh, square root. So um, basically you compute power to 1 divided by p. We can say that two norms, alpha and beta, are equivalent if there exist constants c1 and c2 such that c1 times the first norm, the alpha norm, is smaller or equal to uh, the beta norm, is smaller or equal to c2 times the alpha norm again. So you see that this norm beta is bound by the alpha norm from below and from above. For example, the 1 norm and the 2 norm are equivalent because the 2 norm is always smaller or equal to the 1 norm, which is smaller or equal to square root of n, that is the number of dimensions, times the 2 norm. So we see the 1 norm is bound by the 2 norm from below and from above with appropriate uh, scalars. So here the scalar is 1, and here the scalar is square root of n. And this is true for all vectors x. So how can we measure the distance between vectors? So the obvious answer is the distance between two vectors x and y is x minus y. So we compute the uh, difference between the vectors and then we take a norm where this could be any vector norm. So we have a lot of possible distances just using whatever norms we have in our toolkit. But an alternative here is we're actually using the angle between two vectors x and y to measure the distance between them. Okay, so how do we calculate the angle? We learned that the angle is related to uh, the uh, inner product, scalar product somehow, so the cosine of the angle, so this is what we had before. And so if we could, for example, normalize the vectors and then compute the inner product. So what does that tell us? So if uh, the vectors are very different, then the inner product would be zero. And if the vectors are perfectly aligned after they have been normalized, then the inner product will be one. So why not just use the Euclidean distance in all cases? And as some counterexample why this might not make sense in all cases, we'll use the idea of a 
a term document matrix. So what we'll do is we just convert arbitrary text documents into uh, vectors by counting how often each word in a given word list appears. So the word list could be very large, like all words in the in the English in the Eng English language, but in our example it's going to be much shorter. So there's going to be three terms: term one, term two, term three. Maybe this is soccer, this is championship, and and this is um, surgery. So um, what you see here are then three documents, document one, document two, and document three. And what uh, we are counting is that in document one, we have uh, the term one appears 10 times, term two appears 10 times, and term three appears zero times. And here document two, we have appears one times, one times, and one times. And document three, uh, none of the terms appear. So if we would just take the Euclidean distance, then documents 1 and documents 2 would be very far apart. Because this document 1 just happens to be have a lot of entries, therefore it's just a very, let's call it, long vector. And because it's a very long vector, it's going to be very different from all vectors that are kind of short, like document 2 or document 3, in comparison. However, if we're just uh, looking at the angle between the between these two vectors, or this this we look at the angle between document one and document two, we will see that the angle will be will tell us that these two documents are actually reasonably similar, and uh, they will be quite different from uh, document 3. So both document 1 and document 2 will be quite different from document 3 using this angle metric. The cross product has the notation, the output vector w equals u cross product b, and it's basically the cross product is denoted by this cross or times sign in the middle. The output of the cross product is another vector. Um, the vector that is computed as output is orthogonal to u and v. That means that the inner product between w and u is zero and the inner product between w and v is zero. This is called yeah, cross product or vector product. The direction of these vectors uh, follows the right hand rule. So u, v, and u cross v form a right handed coordinate system. Um, to know what the right handed coordinate system is, this would take some time to explain, so uh, you would have to uh, look that up separately. How big is this uh, cross product? Well, the cross product is a vector, so if we talk about how big it is, let's talk about the length of the vector that we get as output. So what is the length of this output vector w? Well, it's related to the length of u times the length of v times the sine of the included angle between these two vectors. So this reminds us a bit, a bit of the scalar product now, where there was a relationship with the cosine. So now what we have is if the inner product, the vectors were perfectly aligned, then the inner product was maximized. But for the cross product, if the vectors are perfectly aligned, then the output will be minimized. In fact, if u and v point in the same direction, then the cross product will have zero length and be therefore the zero vector. All right. The graphical interpretation uh, looks as follows. We're given two vectors, u and v, that form an angle theta. And the 
cross product is a vector that's orthogonal. It's kind of going up orthogonal. It's the output w that, con that is u cross b. And its length is proportional to the length of u times length of v times sine of this angle theta. How is this computed? Um, the multiple ways to remember this. So one thing that uh, I did in high school was said, okay, w cross product of u cross v, you compute it by, uh, if you look at the first dimension, then you would basically block off u1 and u and v1. So to know if we call these three dimensions or three coordinates x, y, z. So if you want to know the x component of the output vector, that actually has nothing to do with the x components of the input vector, only with the y and z components. And it's like computing the determinant of the matrix that consists of these lower entries. And uh, this scheme is follow, followed forward. So if you want to compute the second entry here, then uh, what you would do is you block out the uh, second components here, and then you get a two by two matrix consisting of u1, v1, u3, v3, and again you would take the uh, determinant of that. And, and so here is the explicit formula of the determinant uh, in case uh, you forgot. So um, one thing that is a bit tricky here, though, is that the um, sign of the uh, determinant is uh, flipped. So unfortunately, here you take the determinant, and here you take minus of this determinant, and here again you take the determinant. All right, that was probably a bit too short to exhaustively review the cross product, uh, but um, just from this simple equation, you should know how to compute it. So now you will see that, okay, how am I going to extend that to four or, or five dimensions? Um, this is not going to happen anyways. Uh, so the, when we talk about the cross product, then we almost always talk about the cross product in uh, three dimensions. There might be some extensions, but uh, we, for, for us, we only uh, talk about the cross product in uh, three dimensions. So um, what are some laws? There's the distributive law u cross b plus w equals u cross v plus u cross w. Commutative, now here the, the sign switches. So u cross v, if we switch the order to v cross u, there is a minus sign in front. So we switch the order, the minor, the sign flips. That means that the cross product is not symmetric. Associative law, u cross v in brackets cross w is not the same as u cross v cross w. So it's not associative. The cross product itself is related to the triangle area. We saw that before, but we'll make that more explicit. So we will have a, just look at this, we have a triangle that is given by the vertices v1, v2, v3, and we can just imagine these vertices, uh, they can be uh, vertices in uh, three-dimensional space. And then we can compute vectors along the edges. So for example, the vector e1 goes from vertex v1 to the vertex v2. This is the vector going along this edge here. And this is computed by v2 minus v1. The edge vector e2 is computed by v3 minus v1. And now the triangle area s, the area of this triangle v1, v2, v3, is computed by taking the cross product between the two edge vectors e1 and e2, then taking the length by computing the two norm, 
and multiplying by one half. So it's important to remember this one half. So the length of the cross product is twice the triangle area. Now we'll go to matrices. Matrices are rectangular areas that uh, store numbers. Now that's a non-mathematical uh, definition, of course. So an M by N matrix, A element of R M cross N, that's typically notation, would be written as follows. So A, the matrices, will try to write in bold font and with capital letters. So the prototypical matrix is exactly written like this, A, bold font. And the entries have subscripts to denote um, where they are. So A11 is first row, first column. And then the first subscript here gives you the uh, row number. So if you go to the next row, it's A21. And the second subscript is the column number. So if we go from this to here, then this is A12, two denoting the column. All right, now the last element is A, M, N. Again, if you look at this notation here, R, M cross N, then we have M rows going down here and N columns going over here. The matrix vector multiplication A, X is computed as follows. Um, this is the matrix A here multiplied by the vector X here and let's just look at the first entry. The first entry is the inner product of the first row of the matrix A11, A12 up to A1n. So this row vector in a product with this x column vector. That means, again, what's the inner product? a11 here is multiplied with x1 plus a12 multiplied with x2 plus 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 a1n multiplied with xn. So that's what you see here. Now, what is the seventh entry of the output vector y? Well, the seventh entry is going to be the inner product of the seventh row of this matrix A with this column vector x. And the last entry is the inner product between the last row and this column vector here. So it is helpful to always have multiple possible interpretations and multiple ways to understand the same thing. So an alternative interpretation is to understand this matrix vector product as taking a linear combination of the column vectors of A. I can say that I will compute a linear combination of this first column vector plus, you know, there's going to be some weight times this first column vector plus some scalar weight times the second column vector plus, 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 some scalar weight times this last column vector. And how this is computed is that what is the weight of the first column vector? The weight of the first column vector is going to be this entry x1. The weight of the second column vector is this entry x2 and the weight of the last column vector is this entry xn. If you look at this notation here, one way to write the matrix here is to write it as column vector form. So you have column vector a1, which is the first column here, column vector a2, which is the second column here, Blah, blah, column vector an, which is the last column here, times x equals 
the column ai, so the ith column, times the ith entry of the vector x, and summed up. Matrix, matrix, multiplication. So we have three uh, matrices here. C, the output matrix, equals A times B. So we take the product between these two input matrices, A and B, and we get the output matrix, C. All right. So um, A is in Rm cross P. B is in Rp cross N. And uh, what we can note is that this dimension P needs to agree with this uh, dimension P. Otherwise, the matrices are not compatible for matrix uh, multiplication. All right, so how do we get the entries Cij of the output matrix from the entries A and B of the input matrices? This is defined by Cij equals the sum k equals 1 to p aik times bkj for all i 1 to m and j 1 to n. So each column vector in b is multiplied. Uh, so, so each column vector in B is multiplied by the matrix A. So going back to the matrix column, uh, by the matrix vector multiplication, you could take the uh, matrix A and multiply the first column vector of B, then you get an output, then you take the matrix A multiply it by the second column vector of B, you get an output, and so on until you multiply the last column vector of B. So given a set of vectors, V1, V2, uh, Vn, element of Rm, with uh, m greater or equal to n, so that means we have fewer vectors than uh, the dimensions of these vectors. So maybe we have seven vectors, but they are in some 20 dimensional space. Then we can consider the set of linear combinations, y. So this is an output vector y that is computed by taking each of these uh, input vectors v1 to vn and multiplying them with a scalar. So we take a sum, a weighted sum, where each of these input vectors vi is multiplied by a scalar alpha i. And um, the vectors v1, v2, vn, so this is a set of vectors, is linearly independent if, all right, so the linear combination of these equals zero if and only if all alpha i equal zero. All right, that's a bit annoying. So what that means is that I'll try to, I'll take these vectors and I'll try to build a linear combination that creates the zero vector. And what that says is if the only way that I can create the zero vector with a linear combination is if all the alpha i's are zero. So if I find any way to build the zero vector without all alpha i's being zero, then this set of vectors is considered to be linearly dependent. And if the only way to obtain the zero vector is if all alpha i's are zero, then the set of vectors is uh, linearly independent. It is not possible to have a in linearly independent set of vectors that has more elements than the space has dimensions. So let's say we have five dimensional vectors but 
10 of them could never be linearly independent. So a set of m linearly independent vectors, so if you have exactly as many linearly independent vectors as the space has dimensionality, then we have a basis of the space. So we then also talk about basis vectors. Um, if we have a basis, then any vector in Rm can be expressed as a linear combination of the basis vectors. This term basis is often abused in engineering or mathematics, where people even call uh, basis vectors uh, any set of vectors that uh, span a space, even if it's not the full space, then it's kind of a basis of some sort of a smaller space. Um, but, you know, if you do the introduction to linear algebra, then typically you call a basis a set of vectors only if they span the whole space. The matrix rank, the rank of a matrix is the maximum number of linearly independent column vectors. So um, we'll have a matrix and then if all column vectors of the matrix are linearly independent, then the matrix rank will be exactly the same as the number of columns. So a square matrix A in R n cross n with rank n is called non-singular or also invertible or non-degenerate. So note here that this has to be square matrices to be called non-singular. A non-singular matrix A, again this has to be a square matrix, has an inverse A to the power of minus 1, or this is called A inverse, satisfying that A inverse times A equals A times A inverse equals the identity matrix. The identity matrix is a square matrix that has zeros everywhere except for on the diagonal you have ones. And there are many different types of in identity matrices depending on the size. So um, if you're talking about matrices of size n cross n, then uh, it often helps to have this subscript n to denote what size the identity matrix has. Often you see this I notation without saying actually how big it is. So a square matrix is not invertible. Uh, so if it's not invertible, it's called singular or degenerate. And the square matrix is singular if and only if its determinant is zero. So what is the rank of an outer product matrix? Uh, x times y transpose element of Rm cross n with x element Rm and y element Rn. Now note that this is not a scalar product. A scalar product um, would be x transpose y, but since we have column vectors, what we have here is a column vector times a row vector. And the output of this outer product, how we call it, is a matrix. So multiplying these two vectors together gives a matrix. And the question is, what is the rank of this matrix? All right, so the answer should be 1. range and null space. V is a subspace of Rm if and only if alpha V1 plus beta V2 is an element of the subspace. So um, what that means is that I get two vectors in this subspace and then I can do arbitrary combinations by multiplying them or 
adding them together and you always need to land back in the subspace. So that means the subspace is kind of closed. Whatever addition and multiplication you do to, with these vectors, you always land back in the subspace. You always obtain a vector in the subspace. So let's look at these examples. Let W, the space, is the vectors x, y, element of R2, such that x greater or equal to 0. All right, so it's the set of all vectors in the plane where the x coordinate is greater or equal to 0. Is this a subspace of R2? All right, we're going to pause and uh, think about it before I say the answer in three seconds. So here, this is not a subspace. Because if I take a vector, let's say 1, 2, and I multiply it with minus 1, I get minus 1, minus 2. I'm already out of this uh, set. All right, w equals 0, x2, x3. Is this a subset, subspace of R3? OK, again, um, maybe pause and think about it and say the answer in three seconds. All right, this uh, should be a, a subspace because you can add, subtract, uh, multiply with any scalar you want. Uh, you'll stay in the subspace. And then uh, last example, 1, x2, x3. Again, uh, maybe pause and think about it. I'll say the answer in three seconds. All right, doesn't seem to be a subspace because if I take any vector of this form and multiply by minus 1, again, I'm out of this uh, subspace. The range space or image space of a matrix or range is denoted by range of A. And these are all the vectors Y that can be obtained by multiplying the matrix A by sum X. So anything, any Y that I can obtain by um, multiplying a by any x, this is in the range space. So this is why, as we know from matrix vector multiplication, is basically any vector y I can form by creating a linear combination of the columns of a. The null space, or the kernel of a matrix a, is defined by all vectors x that if I multiply them with a, they give the zero vector. So what is important to note here is that um, if we have a matrix A and we think of this matrix vector multiplication, um, then this matrix vector multiplication has an input vector, we often call it x, and an output vector called y. So what you see here is a set consisting of output vectors y and with dimension r to the power of m. Now the null space consists of input vectors, that is vectors that the matrix is multiplied with such that a times x equals 0. So the vectors x and the vectors y have a different dimensionality. And therefore also the range of A and the null space of A consists, in the general case, of vectors that can have different dimensionality. From the definition, we can know that the rank of A 
equals to the dimension of the range of A. As we said before, the range of A are all possible linear combinations I can form with the column vectors of A, and so the dimension of that is the rank, because the maximum number of linearly independent column vectors. So the dimension of a space is denoted as dimension of the space, and this denotes the maximum number of linearly independent vectors in the space. There's something called the rank nullity theorem that says that the dimension of the null space of A plus the rank of A equals N for a matrix A in R M cross N. All right. Um, if you want to know the proof of that, you can look it up in Wikipedia. Going to eigenvalues and eigenvectors, let A be an N cross N matrix, then a vector V that's not the zero vector that satisfies A times V equals lambda V is called an eigenvector. So we take a vector V and multiply it with A and we get out a scaled version of this input vector V, then V is an eigenvector. Now, the scalar lambda also have a name, has a name that is the eigenvalue corresponding to the eigenvector V. So we see a restriction here to square matrices. If the matrix would be rectangular, then the input vector V and the output vectors would have a different dimension, a different number of components, and it would never be possible for a vector to be a scaled version of itself. So eigenvalues and eigenvectors can only be discussed in the context of square matrices. Example, matrix A, 0, 1, minus 2, minus 3, and the eigenvectors V1 and V2. You can verify that by multiplying this matrix A with this vectors here and see that you get this output a scaled multiple of these vectors. So in the form of, for, for V1, the vector will be multiplied by minus 1, and for V2, the vector will be multiplied by minus 2. So the eigenvalues lambda 1 equals minus 1, lambda 2 equals minus 2. All right, and again, because this is true, the vectors v1 and v2 are called eigenvectors of A. Suppose that lambda is an eigenvalue of the matrix A with the corresponding eigenvector x. Then if k is a positive integer, lambda to the power of k is an eigenvalue of the matrix A to the power of k with corresponding eigenvector x. This is important since often we want to know eigenvectors of matrices that are formed by multiplying a matrix with itself many times and also uh, we often want to know in the sense of dynamical systems where we compute uh, the behavior of a dynamical system by multiplying a vector with a matrix many, many times, like where does this dynamical system go? So um, this is like an important basis for this analysis, an important uh, start for this analysis. All right. Now, let's say we have a triangular matrix. So we can have an upper or lower triangular matrix that only has values either above the diagonal and on the diagonal or below the diagonal and on the diagonal. So this is an upper uh, triangular matrix that only has values above the diagonal and on the diagonal. So suppose we have such an A that is a triangular matrix, um, then we can easily know the eigenvalues of this matrix. So 
the eigenvalues are the elements on the diagonal a11, a22, up to ann. All right. Suppose suppose that a is a square matrix, and further suppose that there exists an invertible matrix p, such that p inverse a p is a diagonal matrix. So in such a case, we call a di diagonalizable and say that p diagonalizes a. All right. Now. So there is a sufficient condition for this if A is an element of R n cross n and has n distinct eigenvalues, then A is diagonal diagonalizable. So why are we interested in this? Because by diagonalizing a matrix, we can learn something about its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay, so let P be an invertible matrix. Let's see what we can learn. Show that A and P inverse AP contain the same set of eigenvalues. All right, so hint is check that the determinant of the identity minus, minus A is the same as the determ determinant of identity minus P inverse A. P. All right, you can try this yourself or look this up somewhere on the internet. The matrix norm. The matrix norm is a natural extension of the notion of a vector norm and it's extended to matrices. So specifically a matrix norm is a mapping of a matrix to a scalar R that satisfies the following properties. The norm of A is greater or equal to zero for all matrices A. And it can only be zero if and only if A equals zero. So it's greater zero for everything except for the zero matrix, and it is exactly zero only for the zero matrix. Similar to vectors, multiplying the matrix by a scalar and then taking the norm is the same as taking the absolute value of the scalar and then multiplying by the matrix norm. You have this triangle inequality. A plus B norm is smaller or equal than A norm plus B norm. There are induced norms, maybe also called operator norms, that uh, come basically come from vector norms, and uh, we'll see how. So let's say we are given a vector norm, and then the corresponding matrix norm can be computed as follows. So the matrix norm corresponding to the same vector norm is the supremum of a times x divided by the length or, or the, so, so this now is the vector norm of A times X divided by the vector norm of X. So let's just think of the two norm. What that means is that we're going through all vectors X and we see which vector X will be stretched uh, the most in the sense of what's the biggest ratio we can achieve between the length of the input vector x and the length of the output vector a times x. So these are not going to be in the same direction, but we just can compare the length. So if the input vector has length 1 and the output vector has length 10, so if we can find one example, then this is our first candidate, and then so we'll try something that's bigger, and so we go through all the vectors. There's going to be an infinite amount, but whatever the biggest number is that we will get is uh, going to be the corresponding norm. And 
uh, you can kind of normalize this and say, well, let's not look at all vectors. Let's only look at vectors that have norm one. And so the induced matrix norm is the supremum, or you can think of it as maximum, of A times X, uh, the corresponding norm. All right. And so this is defined for the maximum norm, for the two norm, and for the one norm, or any LP norm that you want. All right. So again, the idea is to say that you'll take, maybe this version is best, you take all vectors of length one and see what is the maximum length vector that you can achieve as output. And so um, how kind of strongly a matrix operates on a vector uh, is reflected in the norm. And what you can kind of think of is if a matrix um, has a norm about one, then these might be the uh, numerically nicer behaved uh, matrices than if you have a matrix that have that has a norm, let's say, of a million. Because that means that you can put a small vector in of length only 0 0.1, and then you get a huge uh, vector out of length uh, 100,000. So um, the, the vector norm tells you also a bit of what it, it tells you basically what what does the matrix do to the size length of the vectors. All right. So um, you could show that this is indeed a matrix norm. So th these things are true. So we don't have a, this is more like an exercise. So A times X norm is smaller equals to A norm X norm. A B norm is smaller equals to norm A times norm B. All right. So particularly for all the P norms, the LP norms that we discussed for vectors before, we have this. This is just taking uh, this equation and rewriting it for uh, P norms. Um, all right. So in the special cases of P is 1, 2, and infinity, let's look at uh, the results. All right. So A1 norm is the maximum over the columns sum e equals 1 to m. All right. A2 is sigma max of A, which is the uh, largest singular value of A, or the square root of the largest eigenvalue of A transpose A. So for the infinity norm, we take the maximum of the sums, so maximum over rows. There is something that's not corresponding to any vector norm, but that's often actually what people think of when you talk about the two norm of a matrix. That is the Frobenius norm, the F norm of a matrix A, is you simply go over each entry, square it, sum up all the entries, and then take the square root. The trace of a matrix B is the sum of all the diagonal elements for the matrix B. And so what you could show is that the Frobenius norm of a matrix squared is the same as the trace of A transpose A. In a lot of derivations and proofs, this uh, identity is used. Not in this course, but uh, in, in general. All right. So let's talk about the condition number. Let's uh, this be some matrix norm. Then the condition number of a matrix with respect to this norm 
is defined as the norm of the matrix A times the norm of the matrix A inverse. So let's just say that this norm is induced from the vectors L2 norm, say the 2 norm of the matrix, then the condition number is the ratio of the largest to the smallest singular value. So if the condition number of the matrix is very large, then the matrix is called ill-conditioned. So if it goes very larger, 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 the matrix in some sense becomes more and more like a singular matrix, and the computation of the inverse or solution of linear systems become prone to numerical errors. So let's just look at the following matrix 1, 1, 1, A. And A uh, is not equal to 1. So if A would be equal to 1, then the matrix 1, 1, 1, 1 would be singular. You can easily compute the determinant 1 times 1 minus 1 times 1 is 0. So um, let's just say this A goes towards 1. The matrix will be more and more uh, like a singular mat matrix. It's not exactly 1, but it goes closer and closer. So A inverse is 1 divided by A minus 1 times 1 minus 1 minus 1 A. So as A approaches 1, this part will be totally fine, but this part here is 1 divided by 1 minus 1. This will be close to 0. So this will be a huge number, and then this inverse will be a very large matrix with very large entries. So two vectors x and y are orthogonal if the inner product equals 0. Given a set of orthogonal vectors v1, v2, vn with m greater or equal to n, so Again, the dimensionality of the space is larger than the number of vectors that we have. So, um, and, and then, if, what does it mean for the vectors to be orthogonal? That means that pairwise, the inner product is going to be zero. So I can pick V2 and Vn, inner product is zero, V1, V2, inner product is zero. All right, let's say we have given such a set of orthogonal vectors, um, then, and that means pairwise uh, inner product is zero, then they are linearly independent. All right. Let now the set of orthogonal vectors vi be normalized, so in addition to uh, them being orthogonal, they're also length 1. So all the vectors are ortho uh, orthogonal and they have a length 1. Then they are orthonormal. And so if, if we have um, a space, you know, the, 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 if, if the, we have as many vectors as uh, the space is, uh, has dimensions, then we have an orthonormal basis of Rm, and if we have a bit fewer, then they form some orthonormal basis of some subspace of Rm. So an orthogonal matrix is a square matrix whose columns and rows are orthonormal. Now, this is some of the brilliant naming schemes in mathematics to call an orthogonal matrix something where the um, columns and rows are orthonormal. All right, so you notice the difference here, orthonormal 
and orthogonal. Okay, prove the following properties of an orthogonal matrix. All right, an orthogonal matrix Q, element of R M cross M, has rank M. Again, we said that the vectors, the column vectors, would be linearly independent, therefore it has to have rank M. The inverse is equal to the transpose. That's interesting. So that is Q, Q transpose equals Q transpose Q equals the identity. All right. Now, um, you could kind of see that if you actually compute that out, and then you would see that because if the you get all these inner products and a lot of them will be zero because of the orthogonality, and then sometimes you get an inner product of a vector with itself, and then it's going to be one because of the length one constraint, and so you will see that all the inner products on the diagonal are the vectors with themselves. It's going to give you the ones across the diagonal and everything else will be zero, any vector with any other vector. And so this gives you the identity matrix. Now, the Euclidean length of a vector x is invariant under an orthogonal transformation. So if I take a vector x and multiply it with an orthogonal matrix q and take the two norm, or the Euclidean uh, elastic length, then uh, the vector x has the same uh, length as the vector x multiplied by this matrix Q. So the uh, multiplication is length preserving. The product of two orthogonal matrices Q and P is orthogonal. Let's look at eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a symmetric matrix. The eigenvectors of a symmetric matrix are mutually orthogonal and its eigenvalues are real. It's very important because eigenvalue and eigenvector co computation can often go very ugly, but if we have symmetric matrices, then things often look a lot better. So, if you have a symmetric matrix, then the eigenvectors and eigenvalues are going to be nice. So eigenvectors are mutually orthogonal and eigenvalues are real. So a symmetric matrix means that the mat matrix A is equal to its transpose. Now, any symmetric matrix A in R n cross n can be written in the form A equals u sigma u transpose, where the columns of u are the eigenvectors of A, and sigma is a diagonal matrix, and the uh, diagonal elements of sigma are the corresponding eigenvalues of A. So this is called the eigen decomposition of A, and this works for a symmetric matrix. So we have A equals U sigma U transpose. U has um, column vectors that are eigenvectors. Sigma on the diagonal has all the corresponding eigenvalues. And then U transpose has the eigenvectors again in its rows. What are symmetric matrices? They can come from adjacency matrices of an undirected graph. This could be a symmetric matrix, for example. So there's this courant fischer minmax theorem, um, which I guess we will skip. So here we're going to discuss positive semi-definite matrices and positive definite matrices. Um, a symmetric matrix A is positive semi-definite, if and only if this quadratic form x transpose ax is greater or equal to zero for all possible vectors x. So a matrix A is positive semi-definite if for all vectors this A transpose ax is greater or equal to zero. That means 
that doesn't exist a vector where x transpose ax is smaller than 0. So in general, of course, for a general matrix, this uh, quadratic form x transpose ax can be positive, 0, or negative, and uh, so this is a restriction. Also, equivalently, one could say that a matrix is positive semi-definite if all eigenvalues of A are non-negative. And uh, while there are some variations in how this is defined, almost everybody defines positive semi-definite and positive definite only for symmetric matrices A. Um, another thing is that for positive semitive matrices, uh, we know that x transpose A x for any x is positive semi-definite. Now, this is an even stricter form, positive definite. If you go to positive semi-definite, again, it's denoted as A greater or equal to zero with this greater sign curved, and positive definite is A greater zero, so you can guess how this is stricter. So a matrix symmetric matrix A is positive definite if and only if this quadratic form is greater than zero for all vectors with one exception that is the zero vector. For the zero vector it will always be zero there's no other way uh, so for any matrix zero transpose times A zero is the zero vector but for any other vectors not equal to the zero vector this quadratic form x transpose ax is greater than zero, uh, then it's a positive definite matrix. So uh, equivalently we know that um, a positive definite matrix is a matrix where all eigenvalues of A are positive. Now if we know that the matrix is positive definite, then all principal submatrices of A are positive definite, and we also know that all diagonal entries of A are positive. Now, this doesn't go the other way around, so all diagonal entries of A are positive is not enough for a matrix to be positive definite, uh, but for the first one that is uh, enough, so all eigenvalues of A being positive are guarantees that the symmetric matrix A is positive definite.